This is the Rich Dad Stockcast with Andy Tanner, the show that kicks 401ks in the asphalt and teaches you to be the master of your own stock investing domain. And here's your host, Greg Arthur. Welcome to this episode. I'm calling Be the Shark. You'll understand that title in a second. But first, I want to riff on an email Robert Kiyosaki sent out where he's quoting Warren Buffett, one of Andy Tanner's favorites. <laughs> So I figured two great minds, we can't go wrong here. Warren Buffett said that as an investor, it is wise to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Robert said that quote makes more sense today than ever. Why? Well, after the Corona crisis crashed the stock market, people began jumping into the stock market to buy stocks at a discount and they should, but they did so before they got educated. They knew nothing about the fundamentals of investing or the technicals of investing, and they certainly knew nothing about Andy's favorite, risk mitigation. They jumped in because of greed, not because of knowledge. So what happened? The greed made millions jump into the deep end of the stock market, but they don't know how to swim. So now they're experiencing fear. Remember what Warren said, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Now the sharks come out. Those with the scent of blood and the knowledge to turn those drowning stock swimmers into profit. So it's time to be the shark and go hunting. And with that, let's bring in our own great white, rich dad stock advisor, Andy Tanner. Boy, I feel like we should have Jaws music about there, right? Totally (laughs) should. You know, Greg, that uh, I actually keep my, uh, that quote is right there on my wall. Um, It's one of the ones, it's one of the ones I have, uh, I had printed and mounted. And I think I need to get it redone and make it bigger. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, what a great topic to talk about um, fear and greed and emotions and what drives people. And it's just going to be a great conversation uh, uh, for sure. So I appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. You know, one of the stories Robert always he'll talk about when you when you get on one on one conversation is people are just like those rodents. I think they're called lemon uh lemons lemons i don't know yes. where they just they get afraid and they just start running and they all all of them just run right off the cliff it's just this this <laughs> group herd mentality and it it causes so much damage if you can't think for yourself and you're just following the crowd and so i, I kind of think that's what what warren's talking about here a little bit of greed and fear and those are yeah. two emotions but they they both drive you to the herd and the herd mentality well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, everyone, I, I love, one of the reasons I love the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is not just like when the first, I tell the story a lot. And, and so if someone's heard it before, I apologize. But when my wife and I read it the first time, we closed the book, we looked at each other and said, this is about assets and liabilities, the rich buy assets, not liabilities. So we went out to, uh, seek our fortune and buy assets and we failed miserably. And I was like, who's this Robert Kiyosaki? I should call him. Why didn't you put the address of the house I was supposed to buy in here? You know, and my wife said, maybe we should read it again. And we don't often do encore reading. Usually when you see a movie once you've seen it, you read a book once, but she said, this is works worth studying, not just reading. So he said, all right, next week we'll start it over again. And she grabbed the book and uh, she says, I got it. I know what we missed. I was like, what do you mean? She goes, look at the cover. And, and I says, okay. She goes, well, rich dad, poor dad. We've both got the poor dads. We're halfway there. <laughs> and, and she realized in that moment, she taught me, she said, um, that book's not just about assets and liabilities. It's a book about someone who had someone to help him. And I feel a lot of compassion with that uh, idea because you know, how lucky was he now knowing Robert as I do, he probably would have found a different mentor if it wasn't that one. Right. But I think how many people didn't grow up with him? Well, Warren Buffett, almost every person you find like that had a mentor. And so who was Warren Buffett's rich dad? Who was it? And, uh, it was a man by the name of Benjamin Graham. Oh, he wrote that book. He wrote the book, uh, the intelligent investor. Uh, in my mind, it's called the stock, the stock picker's Bible. Yeah. And, and uh, the thing that's interesting about that book is I've, I do encore reading in that. That's another one we're studying. And when you think of intelligent investor, you think about knowledge and you think about how to. 
And really, when I read that book the second time, it struck me that that book is about what we're really talking about right now, which is where that quote comes from. It talks about temperament and a person's temperament and how they operate. And my friend Blair Singer, you know, as, as you know, Rich Dad advisor, Blair Singer, he says, well, when emotion goes up, intelligence goes down. And I think, you know, it's really true. How many times have I had to say, sweetheart, uh, I didn't mean to say that, I was just emotional, right? Whether you were angry, you know, some of the things I've said to the officials in the basketball games I played in, that wasn't coming from intelligence, it was coming from emotion. And crimes of passion, um, most of the time where we commit uh, either a moral crime of passion or even a, a, a law crime, you know, a, a state law or federal law crime, most of the time it's because people were driven by emotions rather than thinking stuff through. And certainly coronavirus and the unemployment and all that has stirred emotions in people of, uh, you mentioned both of them, on fear and greed. So that might be a good place to start uh, as we talked about, uh, you know, these people wanting to swim with the sharks. <laughs> well, you know, Robert, always, he always tells us that there's two kinds of IQ. Well, there's three. There's, you know, academic IQ. But we always focus on financial IQ at Rich Dad. Yeah. But he always says, in order to truly reach financial IQ, first you need emotional IQ. And I think that's what we're really talking about here. It is. So, so let's talk about that quote. Um, he said, be fearful when people are greedy and be greedy when people are fearful. Now, I have two young sons. And they're 14 and, and, uh, and 12. And I can't say that I think that fear or greed would be a solution to any problem in life, financial otherwise. So the counsel here will be fearful or be greedy. I don't think being fearful or greedy. I think what Warren Buffett was really saying is be smart and don't go, you know, don't get caught up in the emotions of the crowd, pull back and, and be smart because they're, they're usually going to do the wrong thing. So, um, let me, I'll ask you, what do you think greed is? I mean, I have, my I have my definition of what I think greed is, but I'd like to hear what yours is. I think greed is wanting something you don't have. Yeah, I, that's a good, I like that. Um, it's, yeah, I, I think uh, that I agree. When people see an opportunity to get something that, you know, there's a chance for an easy score, and I think it's biological. You know, I always go back to thinking about Africa and, you know, where there's opportune opportunities, animals take those opportunities. I, I think as, as we evolved as creatures, we actually felt before we could think. I wrote a great, I read it, or wrote, I read a great book uh, called The Happiness Hypothesis, and I just loved it. And it kind of, you know, really went into that idea that you know you take a little single cell organism that really can't logically imagine the future it's just oh this thing feels good i'll eat it oh this feels bad it'll probably eat me i'll swim away and that that is so core to who we are as people is the fear of missing out on a meal oh, yeah. or missing out on what we could have causes people to do some crazy things so we might say that greed is the fear of losing out on what could be it's losing out on opportunity. Oh, I, I got to get on the ground floor and I got to get it now. And there's the times now and you feel time sensitivity to things. And I think that's how guys like Bernie Madoff took very, very intelligent people, people who had made millions of dollars. I mean, you just don't make millions of dollars unless you got a couple brain cells operating, right? Right. But, but with the idea of great returns and no risk and, you know, great windfall without a lot of work it sucks people in, it drops their intelligence. And so uh, greed's a big deal. Now, panic is different. Panic is the fear of losing what you got. So in this market, it was interesting because on the one side, you had people watching their 401ks die yeah. and they're panicking. So they're selling things that they don't understand. And then you had these other people and, and I sent you this article, um, from CNBC that said young investors pile into stocks, such a great headline, young investors pile into stocks, seeing a generational buying moment instead of risk, instead of risk. Yeah. Any thoughts on that when you read, did you get a chance to read it? 
Yeah, I, yeah, I, I did read it. And you know what I thought of? I, th I thought of a, a horse with blinders on. They can only see one thing, and it's probably 20% of, of their vision. But that's all they can see because the greed is shutting everything out. And they, yeah. they can't even realize the risk factor. I love that myopic uh, analogy of the blinders. That's fantastic because it really is. And what's funny is they see generational buying open instead of seeing the risk. And if you were to ask me, you know, the, 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 the underlying attribute of the stock market, its signature, its overarching underlying essence is, uh, is uncertainty. Um, the, the, the most, it's the attribute of the market that I care about most is the uncertainty of it. And the fact that they would get caught up in things, it was like, it was like a Nordstrom sale to them. Oh, everything's on sale. You know, we're never going to be able to buy these prices again. And the numbers are simply incredible. As we go through this article from CNBC, um, Charles Schwab, uh, the new accounts for quarter one, these are astounding numbers. Charles Schwab uh, for quarter one 2020 had uh, 609,000 new accounts. Wow. Uh, TD Ameritrade had the same, about 608,000 accounts. And, you know, that's a year over year increase of over 150% for Ameritrade. E Trade had 363,000 accounts. So you've got, uh, what is that, 6, 12, if that's 1.5 million new people that decided they were going to be online investors now, just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that, just three brokerages. That doesn't count like Robin hood and you know, all that other crazy stuff. But in, in their defense, it's in some ways they were right. They were able to identify that there's an opportunity to be had in, a, in the crisis. And that's to me, that's like awesome that they could, could see that the problem is that's the only thing they saw it's all they saw and i certainly uh felt like i had some pretty good picks myself during that time i acquired stocks during that time and i'm very very happy with with what has happened what i'm concerned about you know if you decide to see if you decide to get myopic i love that analogy you gave of the horse blinders and you decide to get myopic um you know, if we moved it into a different thing that's risky, let's talk about something else that's risky um, and superimpose that mentality on something else in a different context and then bring it back to stocks and see how it feels. Um, what if all of a sudden uh, there was a big, big convention in your hometown and it was a big gun expo and all of the guns went on sale? like way on sale. And they say, Hey, great time to buy a gun. In fact, let's get rid of all the restrictions. Let's get rid of all the background checks. Let's get rid of all the hunting safety courses. Let's get rid of any age requirements and let's let kids go out and get these guns. Cause it's a buying moment for guns. You know, I, I, uh, I enjoy shooting a little bit. I'm not, uh, you know, a guy with a big bunker and, you know, machine guns in each hand ready for the, but we enjoy time as a family, maybe down on the farm and a little target shooting once in a while. It's fun to do that. And before we do that, Greg, every time we go through um, safety. Yep. And it's about a two hour drive down to, to the farm where we like to shoot. You know, my, my wife, ha her family has a farm in central Utah. And, uh, as we go down there, I say, okay, son, what's the rules? And they say, number one is always treat a firearm as if it's loaded. I say, what's number two? They say, we never point the firearm at anything unless, you know, it's going to, unless we feel it's going to be destroyed. You know, what's number four? Well, we always look at our target and we, uh, we see what's in front of the target behind it and side to side. And we wonder where the bullet would go if we, if we didn't hit the target. And I say, what's the last one? They say, well, we never put our finger on the trigger until we've acquired a target and ready to fire. And those are just four basic rules that we review over and over and over. We got a couple more about getting them out of the car and stuff. But the fact is, is when you look at stocks, if you took that and superimposed it and they said, well, they didn't even see the risk. 
And so I will say this, there's four asset classes. There's business, real estate, you know, paper assets like stocks and commodities. Of all four asset classes, I don't see anything with wider access, easier access, and more participation with less hunter safety course and education than yep. stocks. Yeah. Because 401ks are made up of stocks too. So I'm gonna say that again. There is not an asset that is more easily accessible, widely invested in, right? Um, with no barriers really to entry. I mean, look at this. We have 1.5 million people just start playing this game. And uh, that's a frightening thought to me because not one of them thought, well, am I qualified to buy stocks? Do I understand the market? Do I understand risk? How many classes did I take in high school specifically on online trading and stock investing? It's interesting. Well, and I'm sure that anyone that did have that thought still thought, well, I don't have time. I got to get in while the sale's going on. And to your point, what made them make that mistake? What emotions were they feeling? Greed and fear of missing out. So a little bit fear of Fear missing out. Greed. Yeah. Just like, uh, it just, just crazy, crazy. That's not a reason to buy something, right? Emotion, even if you get lucky, and some of them did, some probably bought some pretty good stocks. But, you know, I, I'm not a gambler uh, other than you know, investing. You know, I don't go to Vegas and spend a lot of time at the tables there. Uh, I will tell you, though, if I were a poker player, you know, I know a little bit about poker, um, not a lot, but I would be mortified to go to Vegas and sit down at the poker table because I would know as I looked around, I see these guys puffing on their cigars and their brandy, you know, looking at me and they kind of look at each other and say, oh, there's the new guy. Right, right. There's the sucker. And yeah, and, and like... I, I will say this, like a casino, a slot machine is a mechanism that transfers wealth from one group of people to another, right? One group of people to another. And so uh, that's a big deal. I apologize, guys. I got to pause this recording for just a second. Can we do that, Rob? I'm having... And so again, uh, you know, I can't think of an asset class that's more widely held where people don't know what they're doing. And if I'm sitting at that poker table, you know, they know I'm the sucker. And one of the things that's interesting about Vegas is a slot machine. A slot machine is simply a mechanism that transfers wealth from one group of people to another. And you might even say the educated to the uneducated or the people that are on the logic side to the people that are on the emotion side. There you go. Um, you ever seen a, a, like a roulette table or a, or a, uh, a, a 21 table, uh, the, there's a dealer on the casino side and there's the gambler on the other. And you'll notice the people when they gamble as they exclaim when they win and they exclaim when they lose. Oh, great, great, awesome, awesome. Oh my gosh, I just lost it. <laughs> and you'll notice the dealers never exclaim when they win or lose. Oh, you're right. Because every time a gambler wins, the casino loses and vice versa. And they just keep it rolling, boys. They never exclaim. They're like made out of cardboard, you know. Uh, some of them are even electronic now because it's just playing that game over and over. I would submit that the stock market is very much a mechanism that transfers wealth from the uneducated to the educated on a daily basis. I would say so that. Eventually, the stock market will grind is 1.5 billion new people and basically transfer their money to the more knowledgeable, experienced stock traders. There's a literal, a literalness to that. Is literalness a word? Literal, it is literal, now. literalness. Yeah, there's a. It's literal. I'll give you an example. I had a really good friend of mine, smart guy, medical doctor type guy, um, and he'd heard that you could insure your your stocks, you know, with put options and stuff. And so he asked if he could talk to me a little bit and, you know, get a few ideas education wise. And, and at the end, you know, we were looking at where the VIX was and where things were and, and everything. I said, actually, if you were to buy that insurance right now in this moment, I would probably be the one selling it to you. Oh. And I showed him what was interesting is he come up with a trade he wanted 
And quite literally, I showed him in my own account where I was on the opposite end of that trade, where it really would have been uh, a person like him buying those options from a person like me, it, quite literally. And uh, it's just, it was astounding to him to think about, he had it all worked out in his mind, logic and everything. And then I showed him the other side of the coin. He's like, wow. And so uh, there's, a, there's a reality to that. And I would just say to anyone listening, you know, how much do you really know about this? And I guess that's why we have such a horrible culture of advice over education is very few people really love this enough. And, and people ever like, Greg, I tell my kids this, my kids say they want to be wealthy. And every time on purpose, they say, I want to be wealthy. They says, yeah, sure you do. Sure you do. I give them this. Sure you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Sure you do. Because if you pull a hundred people, and say, who wants to be wealthy? You get 100 people say, yeah, I want to, but they don't really have that think and grow rich burning desire. They talk about as number one thing in think and grow rich, the burning desire. And so they say, well, I get it all the time. Well, just tell me what to buy. I don't really want to learn it. Uh, and you and I get it all the time. Uh, being you know, so integrally integrated with Rich Dad, people all the time call in on Robert's radio show. Well, if, I, if you had ten thousand dollars, what would you do with it? You know, advice, advice, advice. Yep. My question is, what's the last class you took? What's the last seminar you went to? What's the last book you read? And you think one book gets it done? You think you read *The Intelligent Investor* by Benjamin Graham? You're gonna be the next Warren Buffett. I guarantee you, Buffett has studied harder than most people at a younger age to get where he is. So, so that's the one side, you know, uh, of the coin. But that's. But that's like, okay, everything you said there makes total sense. But when you go out there and you try to find that teacher to teach you, how, how do you judge your teacher? Like, I swear, yeah. all of them are, they're just trying to sell you crap. They're not trying I, to teach uh, you. They don't yes. care about you. They're just, there's, they're not teachers. They're salesmen. And I, I feel that not just in stocks, real estate investing, business, yes. and it's it. hard to find a true teacher. You know, you make a great point right there because when Marcy and I came to that epiphany that I mentioned about saying, well, we, you know, when she said, hey, we both have the poor dads, we're halfway there. You know, she said that with love for our poor dads because I love them more than any of my rich dads. They're just okay. incredible human beings. They just didn't learn about wealth. Big deal. You know, her dad was a dairy farmer. My dad was a school teacher. They're not supposed to know about money. It's not a fault thing. So what happened in that moment is exactly what you said, Greg, is we shifted from saying, well, I want to go find deals to I want to find a teacher that can help me. And I'm telling you, that's not an easy problem to solve, just as you said. Um, you go through a few teachers as you, right. as you go through. So I remember my first teacher, his name was Greg. And uh, just there you go. And... Uh, you know, it took a while to find him, but when I, how did I know? Um, number one, I found him because he could show me the process of what it looked like rather than just telling me what to do. Yeah. You fall. That's a big difference because if a person says, well, this is what you should buy and here's my advice to you, you already know they're not a teacher, but if they can show you, well, it's like, are they giving you a fit? Here's the litmus test. Are they giving you a fish or showing you how to fish? And as long as they're giving you fish, you know they're not a true teacher. Right. But if you actually can leave that person after some time with them and feel like, my gosh, I feel like I'm a better fisherman than I was yesterday, then you've probably got a better teacher. So really what you're saying is before you jump into the stock market, you better find yourself a rich dad. Well, sure it, it's everybody's choice. You know, I mean, they, they can jump in if they want to and gamble. A lot of people go to Vegas, gamble, knowing they'll lose and enjoy the the experience, I suppose. But yeah, I, I think Greg, well, it doesn't, I think it just makes sense, not because you or I told them to do it, but when they look at the choice they have in front of them, say, well, I can invest uh, as a newbie and hurry up and try to make a lot, or I can invest uh, as a wise investor. Here's what's really interesting. What they got wrong, I believe, is they said, this is a generational buying moment. That's in quotes in this article. Um, Warren Buffett, bought his first stocks in 1942. 
And he's bought stocks every year under every U.S. president, Democrat, Republican, every Congress. He just kept on buying them. And what I think people don't understand is there's a lottery mentality of like, I have to hit the big one and I have to get it right. Look, I can go at any time and uh, run a business and I can go at any time and collect rent uh, for my real estate. I didn't buy my real estate and like, oh, here's a buying moment. Right. You know, I just put up a house for rent uh, last week and we got a renter in there and that'll increase, increase our cash flow. It has nothing to do with coronavirus, nothing to do with these moments like, oh, I got to get it now. Oh, now's the time or I miss out forever. It's that fear of missing out that's incorrect. Um, there's no generational buying moment here. You know, you, you, could, you, can, you can buy at any time if you buy smart, right? You can buy at any time if you buy smart. Yeah, that, that makes great sense. Robert always says that too. Like, like the, the number one thing he hears is, oh, you can't do that here. Oh, yeah, all here. the time. Like, yeah, I've and, been there. Yeah, and same thing with Robert, Robert and Kenny especially. Every year they're buying new apartment buildings. They're, they're adding to their the asset collection, and they're not waiting for the next big real estate crash. Yeah, now, I mean, when I it happens, great. They're ready. I mean, the reason Kenny's ready, you know, he'll have times where he understands the cycles. There's no question Kenny sees a, a buying opportunity, not right now, but later on. And he'll, he'll manipulate that. But the reality of it is I got other friends that are buying right now as well. And it's really about a person's education more than anything else. So on that, you know, as you look over here in this article, you know, they, they, uh, you know, Robinhood, Millennial Favors stock trading app. That is so bad that you have a stock trading app. <laughs> uh, they saw a mind-blowing 3 million new accounts in the first quarter. Oh. So, so we add that before, that's 4.5 million people that have opened up an account. And I can't imagine they took one class before they did it. Um, despite glitches and crashes on heavy volume taste. Uh, quote, the, listen to this, quote, the access to trading, there are no barriers to entry anymore. It's on your phone. So you can buy whatever you want. Finan fractional shares are available. If you can't pony up $1,400 to buy Google, uh, you can still own all the FANG stocks, meaning, you know, Facebook, Amazon, and right. all that. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But here, here's another quote that might be worth reading on it. Hundreds of thousands of market newcomers is great for the uh, dem democratization of the stock market. However, with newness comes a lot to learn. Quote, if you don't know what you're doing, it's almost gambling. It's almost speculation. And it sounds like fun. Uh, you experience very quick run-ups and run-downs. Uh, it's entertainment. Isn't that nuts? Uh, you know, and they, they talk about all the people who gamble and get their gambling fixed. The casinos are all closed. So they go into the stock market to bet and get that fixed. Is that nuts? Oh, that's... That's not a long-term wealth plan. <laughs> so, no, not so much. It's not legacy. That's not legacy stuff. So, so it know? is an interesting thing. And you talk about swimming with the sharks. They don't understand derivatives. They don't understand Jerome Powell, who's going to speak. They don't understand... Federal Reserve, they don't, they don't understand this stuff, and yet they're in there. They, there's a, I guess I get a little ire in my voice, Greg, because there's a lack of respect. Um, I remember, I might have told this story before, I remember I was on a flight from Salt Lake to, to Atlanta, and I was sitting next to a surgeon, and for four hours he told me how awesome he was, oh, and how great. experienced he was, and how hard he'd worked, and all the great things he'd done, and finally the intercom said we were approaching in Atlanta, and he kind of I saw me getting my stuff together and he says, so what do you do? I said, Oh, you know, I teach investing. We invest a little bit. And he says like stocks and stuff. I go, yeah, I like stocks and stuff. And immediately says, Oh, you know, I've been thinking about making a few moves. You got any ideas for me? And I just want to say, dude, I just sat here for four hours and heard how hard you studied. Right. What if I looked at you and said, you know, I think I'm going to trade out my tricuspid valve tonight. You got any, you got any, you know, my kitchen table, you got any tips for me on that? And he'd say, son, you're out of your league. You don't respect how hard I've worked in med school and graduate school and internships and residencies. Well, you know what? It takes a little, takes a little while to get good. 
it's like the 401k, Greg. The thing that pisses me off most about the freaking 401k is that it sells people an idea that they can get rich without being smart. Yeah. I don't know any rich people that aren't smart. I don't, you know, unless they inherited their money and they usually lose it too. I just don't personally know anyone who I, I feel I could look up to and got very, very wealthy that I could learn from that wasn't smart. Yeah. Um, they, I, they, they, they don't respect it. One of the things you said is, is you keep saying the word respect. And I think that's one of the problems with the stock market itself because it is so easy to get into. And the reality is me, Joe Schmo, I can be doing on a much smaller scale, but I can be doing the exact same thing Warren Buffett's doing. So for your poker analogy, I could be sitting at the Warren Buffett table of poker. Yeah. But guess what? I'm going to lose my shirt. It's quite possible. <laughs> I'm dead meat. So the person listening to this, you know, it's important to personalize this message, the person listening, and I'll just do it with some questions is, you know, how much, how much do you really care about your investments? And do you want to rely on other people? And if you do, that's fine. If you, if you but understand you'll live with that result. And, uh, or is this something you really care about? I'd imagine if they've tuned in, most people that, you know, seek out Rich Dad and find themselves here, um, they care about it. And is this a life skill or a skill for hire? Here, these people have an app now. That makes this, oh, I'll have this app that does it for me. Can right. you see the something for nothing greed in that? I mean, the, greed is the fear of missing out on a free meal, an easy lunch. It's, it's walking down the, the savanna in Africa, you know, hungry and tired, wanting to survive. And all of a sudden you see a, a, a fawn with a broken leg and you're a tiger and it's like free meal counts and that urge is almost uncontrollable uh, for many many people and, and here we have 4.5 million new accounts in just four brokerages I mean there's a lot more than four and that's that's just insane um, to think about this the quarter included 27 of the 30 highest volume days in Schwab's history in the history of Charles Schwab this quarter had 27 of the 30 highest volume days ever. I mean, you think of all the crashes we've had and people getting in and out. So, you know, that's the first half. The other thing that's funny is, is on, uh, here's, uh, here's almost exactly 30 days later. You know, this article was published back on May 12th. And 30 days later on June 11th, we have another article that says, top stocks on Robinhood brokerage get crushed as market violently reverses. I mean, it's just, uh, just, no. it's just, it's almost like the guy said it in the other article, right? Uh, you know, these ups, no. these downs. Yep. And I just wonder, you know, what are these people's emotions like now? Because now that you're in and it starts getting work, now what do you do? Because they've already put all their money in. I've, yeah. I've seen people make some of the craziest, dumbest mistakes uh, out of greed, and then they get fearful and yank their money. I mean, who, what are they going to do now? Well, that's something that Robert always says that, it took me a while to really grasp, but he said uh, a, a bad investor can make the best investment deal trash, but a great yeah. investor can take the worst investment deal and turn it into an opportunity. So, so it's, not yeah. about, it's not about the stock market. It's not about anything, anything. It's not about the timing of it. It's not about the purchase. It's about the investor. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I love that word function. What's it a function of, right? And when people say, well, should I get in stocks right now or should I get in real estate right now? They're making their success. They believe it's a function of the investment exactly. or the asset class. Exactly. But the wise person really understands it truly is a function of the investor. And when all these guys, you know, investor isn't about what you do. It's about what you know, because you can invest knowing nothing and not be a true investor, right? I don't think these 4.5, they're investing, <laughs> they're certainly investing. Does that make you an investor? Because you're investing. I mean, you know, I can go in into the kitchen and I can be cooking. <laughs> but am I a chef just because I'm cooking? You know, am I a cooker? You know, um, hopefully I stay out of the kitchen. I can do ribs though. Not too bad with the ribs. They'll turn out. Well, that's what's important. It's because of what uh, of what people know. So. Um, here's what's amazing is they said they didn't see the risk. They saw the generational buying moment. And I know you have one of these. The, I, I said earlier that, you know, the access to the stock market on your phone now, 
right? The ability to play this game and come to the, you know, the Warren Buffett table, as you said, yeah. is unprecedented. I mean, you can get set up and approved and you're trading stocks all of a sudden or currencies or whatever. And so this, there's this broad access without education. Well, here's another thing unique to this asset class, though. It's the only one I know of where you can truly practice in a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is there's no, it'd be tough to paper trade buying an apartment building. Right, right. It'd be tough to paper trade buying a franchise because you couldn't really experience it without doing it. Well, here, rather than, than seeing a generational buying moment, you know, what if they saw a generational education opportunity? What if they looked at that and said, you know what? This market probably requires more smarts today than it ever has. The VIX is through the roof. We have, we have the Federal Reserve printing money like they've never printed before. Listen to Jerome Powell. You know, these are unprecedented times. What if they said, you know, now is the time for me to say, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of my degree. I'm proud that I went to college and, and learned accounting or whatever. But I think learning investing now at this time, it might never be more valuable than ever. Maybe what I'll do is I'll open up a paper trade account. What if we saw 10 million paper trade accounts open and all of a sudden the headline says people decide to practice and begin learning the stock market because they're sick uh, of their brokerages. And, you know, you talk about advice, Greg, I had a, I'm, I'm rewriting my book, 401 Chaos. And one of the things I've done is I've gone and talked to a lot of financial planners who sit down. I had a friend of mine, his name is Jackson. And I called him and, and all he does every day is talk to the older folk that come in, you know, they're, they got a million dollars and it's not enough. Right. It's not enough. And, and I asked him this question, I go, what are the fees on all this stuff for advice? How much are people paying for advice? Mm -hmm. And what are the lowest ones? He said, well, the lowest ones are going to be your index funds to just buy the S&P 500. And I said, well, how much does intelligence, does it take to do or take whatever the market's going to give you anyway? Right. I go, why are they charging anything for those? I go, honestly, how much expertise does it do to throw someone in the S&P and buy a bunch of stocks like Robinhood? How much expertise is there with that? Zero. So what are you paying for? Nothing. Right. You know, and, and, and Wall Street gets your assets under management now. Why, why have brokerage fees been eliminated? Because it never was about the brokerage fees. It's about getting your assets so they can do stuff with it, right? Because they, obviously they're doing stuff with it. That's called derivatives, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so it was kind of an interesting month in, in retrospect to see all these people get in and in the same CNBC headline, you know, Young investors pile into stocks, seeing generational buying moments that are risk. You know, 29 days later, uh, top Robin Hoods, or top stocks on Robin Hood brokerage get crushed as market violently reverses. I mean, it's just, uh, it's the same thing every year, over and over and over. So for the people listening, how do we help them? Like well, we told them like, you know, control your emotions. Recon maybe recognize your emotions. I don't, yeah. I don't know how easy it is to control. But, but what do they do? Because we want them to learn to invest in the stock market. We want them to be taking action. And if they want to, you know, if that's what they want, I think first thing, as far as emotion goes, it starts with awareness and emotional awareness. And this will not only help you in your investing, it'll help you in your life. Uh, one of the things that my wife and I do that's a lot of fun is we practice on our children a lot. <laughs> and we, we try to see, because, you know, kids are going to do stuff and make you crazy. And uh, it's really interesting because we try to take the temperature of each other when something stressful is going on, especially like keeping the schedule, right? right. We have piano lessons here. We have jujitsu here, whatever, basketball practice, whatever we might have been doing with them. And when our temperature comes up, we kind of look at each other and kind of have that little code like, boy, be aware of those emotions. I'll tell you, that's fantastic. As an emotional guy, that's helped me because I'm very, you know me, I cry, I, you know, I'm emotional. Uh, I think that's the first thing is start becoming aware of emotions. I think the second thing is a study. What you focus on tends to expand. And for you, wherever your situation might be, it might be a simple book. You know, maybe The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham's a little higher level than when you want to start off with. 
I'll tell you, there's this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad that I really, really like and Cashflow Quadrant that I really, really like. And as you read those books that, you know, we've been talking as advisors a lot about neuroplasticity, about how your brain begins to change. And it's not so much about going to school at the beginning as a context change, right? Like the first thing a person I think could do for themselves is decide, okay, which is it for me? Is it education or advice? Once you decide it's advice, you're going to go on one path. Once you decide it's education, I'll take you on a very different path. And so that decision of context, I think for anyone listening, is a great start. And then it might be a book. It might be a, 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 an audio series. It might be a class. Uh, it might be an online webinar or a seminar. It might be a conversation with a mentor uh, that, that you can sit down with and, uh, and learn from. You know, it's interesting sitting down with mentors because you can see pretty fast if they know what they're doing, if they'll show you the financial statement. Right. You know, Robert always said the, the only shortcut he knows is to find a good coach or mentor. Yeah. And, and he was actually talking about uh, real estate, but. Well, it's true in stocks. Yeah. Why is it a shortcut? Because you get to, um, you get to take advantage of their life experiences and, their, and the knowledge that they've already acquired. And you can learn from their mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Set you back a bit. You're still going to make your own. But I, I love this conversation because it's a high-level conversation. I think it gives people a chance to reflect on what they want to be. And what do they want to, you know, what do you want to be? Um, people love result. Uh, you know, right now my son, he wants to be a real estate investor. And I, I sat him down and I says, let's talk about why you want to be a real, inv real estate investor. Because right now, son, I believe the reason you're headed that way is because you're friends with Kenny McElroy and you've sat in his Ferrari and you've sat go. in Robert's Ferrari and you sat in Than Merrill's nice cars. And, and, you know, my son knows so many people who are wealthy. I said, son, you got to realize I can show you real estate investors who got their butts kicked too and didn't get that. What you really want to know is do you love the process? And I think the reason people get caught in a Robin Hood app is they don't want to do the process, which is fine if they don't, but you're not going to get great results unless, unless a person falls in love with process. So the information or the invitation I have for people is, look, you know, do you like the idea of being smarter? Is it just the money that you want? And, and that's fine. If you want to try to go around, I've seen a lot of people make it that way. Is it just the money you want? Or do you really like the idea of waking up in the morning a year from now saying, I really understand stocks. I really feel confident now in going in here because I understand it. I'm not just, oh, I better get in now. And I, I'm not in over my head. Or perhaps walking into Vegas at that, at that uh, table and having studied with great mentors who say, well, once you walk in that table, let me tell you what you'll find. You'll see this guy and this guy and this guy, and this is what you'll do. And you come in knowing that the best advantage you have is they think you're the new guy now. Right, right. Yeah, you know how, to, how many cars do I get? <laughs> Is it five or seven? What's the river? You know, and, and, and there's, a, there's a beauty and a confidence that comes in the process by being able to sit down in business and, and negotiate knowing what you're doing. Um, so you said a bunch different. of things here. You said, one, identify for our situation, for our podcast, that the stock market is your desire. Two, get educated. And there's a ton of different ways to do that, depending on the way you learn best, really. Yeah. Three, yeah coach or mentor and then something you mentioned earlier was be, be paper trading practice for sure all that stuff i think a person uh if they can trade through a dip uh i i think the problem with the 90s is you could have thrown a, a darts at a list of stocks and come out winning in the 90s but when you can paper trade through a crash and say wow i handled this well i managed this risk really really well uh, that's when you might be ready to hop in a little bit and, and do a little active trading. And even the long-term stuff that I like takes financial education. Yeah. It's not quite as sexy as a uh, buy low, sell high and make a million bucks in 24 hours. Yeah. It's not sexy, but it's more realistic. Right. It's like, <laughs> I think you like put the, the robe over the girl in the bikini and you know. you know what? Yeah. And what you just said was important is, you know, you said it doesn't look as sexy. And right there, that comes back to that primal idea of 
ooh, this looks good and this idea looks good and this, this you yeah. know, here's this little fawn that broke her leg, free meal. Those emotions are always there. Um, that was one of the most difficult things. I still fight it today because uh, it's part of me. I'm not going to take that part of me out, but I do have to recognize it and say, hey, Andy, settle down. Calm Isn't that down. funny? The key, to stock, the, key, the key to stock investing is like everything else, personal development. It, oh, it's huge. God damn it's, that, oh, but I don't want to do that, Greg. I, know, I, I don't know. want to do personal That's development. Work. Think about what people are saying. I don't want to develop. I don't want to do personal development. That's nuts. Oh, I don't want to get better. I don't want to be smarter. I want to be more disciplined, more in control, healthier, happier. Oh, no, I don't want any of that. I don't want to get better. That's humanity. It's crazy. Yeah. Personal awesome. development. So awesome stuff. So if you're listening, you know, I'm, I'll give you a little advice. Get educated before you swim in these waters uh, because the stock market is simply a machine that transfers wealth from the educated and disciplined and temperament to people who don't, uh, who are not tempered, not smart, not educated. So there you go. Well, Andy, thank you so much, man. Great time, man. I love these weekly uh, conversations we get to have. I did too. And hopefully we help some of these minnows learn that they want to become sharks and how to do it. That's right. You don't want to, you don't want to be a minnow swim with the sharks. No. <laughs> Grow some teeth. Get it. Right? Yeah, that's right. All right, awesome. man. Well, then let's talk next week. Awesome, man. Very cool. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Awesome.